All right, let's talk about chapter 31, radioactivity and nuclear physics. Uh, pretty cool little picture here. Um, radiation source shooting radiation out of the uh, synchrotron there. So we're going to talk about nuclear radioactivity, radiation detectors, and how to detect it. Um, what's going on in the nucleus of an atom? Nuclear decay, half-life, binding energy, and quantum tunneling. So uh, radioactivity is... Um, when you have excess energy inside of an atom, um, it wants to decay to a lower energy state. So we've talked about if you push an electron up to a higher energy state, it wants to go back down uh, to the lower energy state, and it will emit a photon with energy HF. Um, so you can get the frequency of the photon when the electron does that. Same is true for atoms. Atoms can be in unstable configurations, and when they jump down to different energy levels, they emit different particles. Sometimes it's radiation, like X-rays or gamma rays. Uh, sometimes it's particles, like alpha particles and beta particles. Um, so the three types of particles are alpha, beta, and gamma. And um, the different particles were detected by Rutherford. Um, he shot uh, out of uh, a lead box, a source, I believe it was uranium, which emits all the particles and uh, put a magnet there and then what he noticed is that the stream of particles split into three distinct uh, parts the photons or the gamma rays he called them go straight through they're not affected by the magnet because they don't have a charge the alpha particles and the beta particles are oppositely charged positive and negative so they curve opposite directions because the force they receive from the magnetic field is positive or negative um, the alpha particle turns out to be uh, a proton or a combination of some protons and neutrons and the beta source is uh, an electron okay so um, uh, alpha particles here um, you can stop an alpha particle uh, with a sheet of paper um, it will only travel a few centimeters of air before it dies or a couple of millimeters of skin tissue so alpha particles aren't very uh, penetrative Beta particles, you can stop with a little piece of aluminum. Um, it'll travel through uh, most of you um, before stopping. Gamma rays actually uh, are the most dangerous of the particles, and um, it, you need um, a significant amount of lead to stop them, um, a very high-density uh, material. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's continue on. So... Um, the penetration of the radiation depends on the energy of the particle. So you can see that a beta particle with higher energy can make it further into the material than a beta particle with a lower energy. So this kind of makes sense to you. Um, uh, as it hits different materials, the different materials can have different effects. So um, if all the particles have the same energy, you see the alpha and beta particles make it about the same through the material the gamma particle travels all the way through. So the gammas are more penetrative, so they're more difficult to shield, is the terminology we use. And this is why X-rays and gamma rays go through your body, um, which are just photons, high-energy photons, and we use them to make X-rays. Um, so radiation detection and detectors. Uh, this is a film badge for a worker, like when I'm working at Fermilab, I wear a dosimeter and it measures how much radiation I'm exposed to, and you have to turn them in every month to make sure you don't go over the limit for a radiological worker at a uh, national research facility or whatever. Um, and the way it works is the um, uh, film gets developed, so to speak, um, the more it's exposed to uh, radiation. Another way to detect radiation, um, so for example, if I am at Fermilab and I'm working, I have a dosimeter on my body, if I take something out of a controlled area, um, you have to put it on a uh, uh, Geiger counter. It looks like this. And what it does is it measures the amount of radiation uh, being emitted by uh, whatever you're bringing out of the uh, con con enclosure. And as long as it's below the cer a certain amount, you don't have to tag it or uh, deal with it. It's a non-controlled item. And they're called Geiger counters. And Geiger counters um, are there, that's where the sample is placed and it will measure radioactivity um, by uh, uh, it, there's a voltage difference there and when particles travel in there can ionize the um, gas that's in there and then that can cause electrons uh, to be uh, 
accelerated and when those electrons are detected um, from the incoming radiation, then the Geiger counter makes a beep. It sounds like a chirp, 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 chirp. Um, another way to detect radiation is with something called a photomultiplier tube or a PMT. And a PMT is a, uh, it, it works based on the photoelectric effect. So a photon comes in, hits the surface of, well, there's two ways, okay. This is getting a little ahead of things. There's a scintillating material here. Let's say we don't have the scintillating material. So let's say you just have a photon and the photon hits the surface of what's called the photocathode and it knocks one electron loose. That electron is accelerated to here. Maybe there's a 200 volt difference here and it's accelerated to there and that electron will knock off two electrons and then it's 200 to 400 here, 200 to 400 volts here. Okay, and then from here to there, 600 volts, another 200 volts. So boom, 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 you get this cascading. And suddenly, you have turned one photon into uh, a million photons. So the gain here is usually 10 to the 6 for a, a good PMT, which means it, has, it magnifies the photon energy by a million, basically. So you can actually detect a single photon. Um, another way to amplify the signal is the scintillating material. When radiation comes in, it doesn't have to be a photon. It could be a other type of radiation. It will fluoresce the material, which we talked about fluorescence, cause it to glow, and then you get a bunch of photons hitting the PMT, and then you get a big signal coming out of the end of the PMT. So that's how you detect radiation, um, is indirectly by um, uh, measuring its light. Um, there are another, other types um, of detectors called SIPMs, Silicon photomultipliers works on the same avalanche kind of uh, process, but the avalanche process is limited um, by, uh, uh, or not limited, but um, you use uh, layers of doped silicon to uh, generate the um, avalanche of things. Okay, so the substructure of the nucleus, um, uh, it's pretty cool, all these different things. The substructure of the nu uh, nucleus, is you have protons, neutrons, electrons. That's what's going on um, inside the nucleus of the atom. Um, and the nucleons are the proton and the neutron. So when we talk about the nucleons, we're talking about the protons and the neutrons that are at the center of the thing, at the whatever. Um, the uh, table 31.2, where is that? Here it is, table 31.2. So you've got the proton, you've got the neutron, the electron. You've got the mass in kilograms, and you've got the mass in atomic mass units, and you've got the mass in E equals mc squared, um, uh, or that probably, should probably be mev per c squared there. But uh, okay, um, the main thing here is that uh, to describe the um, atom, let's say, uh, let's look at. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, oxygen, I think, is atomic number eight. Um, so the symbols A, X, Z, and N are used in this way to describe the uh, whatever atom we're talking about. So the number of the protons in the nucleus is the atomic number Z. So for uh, oxygen, that number is eight, for example. Okay, um, so if you're talking about Z, the number of protons, the number of electrons, that's eight, okay? X is the symbol for the element, so this would be oxygen, oops, don't, and there we go, O, okay? So X is O, uh, if it was iron, we'd put Fe, if it was something else, we'd put whatever. Um, so for example, the, the calcium is uh, Ca, so you'd put Ca there if we're talking about cal calcium. Um, Z then and X are redundant because Z uh, is the um, number eight. Eight refers to oxygen, so eight and O are redundant, uh, so you don't really need to know that. Um, uh, N would be the number of neutrons, um, so it could be eight for oxygen, and then so you'd have a total of 16 uh, nucleons in the, uh, uh, in the nucleus. So for oxygen, um, eight, and O are redundant. This eight and that O are redundant. They mean the same thing. 16 is redundant too, because if you have eight neutrons and eight protons, then you have a total of 16 nucleons. So eight plus eight is 16. You don't need that there either. 
and A is just the number of neutrons plus the number of protons, and that's called the mass number. It's the total uh, number of uh, uh, nucleons in there. So, oh my gosh, I just randomly chose oxygen, but here it is. Oxygen is the example they used here. Uh, so maybe I subconsciously read that. So, uh, for example, for oxygen, oxygen is the number eight, and it has eight protons, eight neutrons. So the total number of uh, nucleons is 16, so the mass would be 16 uh, U, and which was defined up here, one U is that many kilograms. And uh, uh, the blah, 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 yeah, so anyway, so what is U? 12 U is the mass of carbon, so that's where you get your U and carbon from for the masses. Okay, so um, uh, generally, yes, so you can simplify everything down to AX, usually. Okay, and AX tells you all the information you need. For example, if I had uh, 16 and oxygen there, then I know automatically, since O is means 8 protons, that there are 8 neutrons in this because I can just do 16 minus 8. Uh, so the where this comes down to being important is when we talk about isotopes, because isotopes are when you have different numbers of neutrons. So, for example, hydrogen is just one proton. So hydrogen would be H, one proton. You could even put zero neutrons and one uh, proton, or w one total nucleon there, like that. Or if you have a neutron in there, now it's H, and then you have two total. Or let's put two neutrons in there. You still have hydrogen, but now it's three. So you can add more neutrons to the nucleus of an atom to change its uh, uh, isotope values, uh, but it does not change its, the proton is the only thing that determines the name of the, of the atom. So by giving it different um, uh, neutrons, you change it to an isotope. And so um, this H1, H, so you can see that a lot of this is redundant, so all I need to do is write um, for the one isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, H2, uh, for tritium, H3, okay? And uh, that's what you do. And, you know, instead of calling this 3H, we call it H3. So that's what they're saying here. We read this backwards. So helium-4 would be written as 4-helium. Okay, it's a little bit weird, but that's what we do because saying helium-4 is easier than saying 4-helium. Um, so you could have helium-4, you could have helium-3, you could have helium-5, whatever. Um, uranium-238 would be 238U. And so uranium... If we're talking about uranium-238 for making nuclear power plants or nuclear weapons or something, uranium-238, that means we look up the quantum number for uranium, it's 92. So 230, 238 minus 92 would give you the number of neutrons in the atom. Okay, and then that would tell you which isotope it is. Um, so it would have 146 neutrons, even though it only has 92 uh, protons. And that's because when you go to higher Z, you need more neutrons to hold the nucleus together um, uh, than at smaller ones. Uh, okay, so um, the radius of a nucleus um, is uh, dependent on the number of nucleons, A, uh, to the one-third power. So if you want to determine the size of the uranium atom, Z, uh, A is going to be 238, so we're going to use this, um, this initial radius, R0, uh, and then multiply it by... Uh, one, uh, 238 uh, to the one-third power, and that would give you the uh, full, um, give you the uh, uh, radius of the atom. So they get larger as you get more things in there, which makes sense. Um, okay, so if you want to find the radius of iron 56, so iron um, is, uh, you'd write iron 56 as 56 Fe, and um, if you look up what iron is in the um, table, well, we don't even need to, we don't care because it's iron 56, which tells us everything we need to know about it. A is 56 there, um, so we just take 56 up to the one-third power, and then we can get the radius of the uh, uh, nucleus that way, which is pretty cool. The uh, density is mass per volume, and you can calculate what the density must be then um, with that radius and that number of particles in there, uh, which is... Uh, Actually, a lot of kilograms per meter cubed, okay? Um, 
Uh, so the density found here is so large as to cause disbelief. It is consistent with earlier discussions we have had about the nucleus being very small and containing nearly all the mass of the atom. Nuclear denses, densities, such as found here, are about 2 times 10 to the 14 times greater than water in general. Um, so, yeah, so most of your, uh, 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 you know, mass is, is at the nucleus. That's the point of that. So as far as stability is concerned, um, this chart of the nuclides is the famous plot of... Um, yeah, so famous, right? Nicki Minaj is singing about the chart of the nucleides. So the number of neutrons here and the number of protons there, um, you'd expect in the atom, oh, iron, uh, oxygen, eight protons, eight neutrons. Keep going up gold, you know, 70-some uh, neutrons and protons. It should be equal numbers. Well, there's the line for N equals Z, number of neutrons equals the numbers of protons in the atom for stable uh, uh, isotopes. What you see is that as you go to higher Z, it actually deviates slightly up. So you actually need more neutrons than... So, for example, if we look at this element, we've got... In order for it to be stable and not decay to something else, we have 85 neutrons there, but only 65 protons. And then your uranium-238 um, is at uh, 92... Uh, or, yeah, 90... What is uranium-92, right? Yeah, 92... Um, uranium-238, so uranium-238 is up here, 238 uh, nucleons, so up there would be 100 and whatever number of neutrons, but only 92 numbers of protons. Um, so this, this chart here is showing you what's stable, what we find in the universe is uh, being uh, stable. Okay, so um, uh, continuing on, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Yes. Okay, so um, nuclear decay is when um, a uranium-238, for example, um, can decay into a uh, lighter element, one that's more stable. And there's a series of decays. You know, you have the parent decays decaying to daughter decays, and those become parents and decay to daughter things. So, for example, uranium-238, um, after four and a half billion years... Okay, will decay to thorium-234 and then to uh, all the way down and actually back to, eventually gets back to uranium-234 uh, though instead of 238 and then down to radium and eventually down to lead-206. So when we talk about um, uranium uh, dating or radiocarbon dating, what we're doing is measuring the ratio of lead to uranium in some samples um, because we know it takes four and a half billion years for uh, half of uranium to decay. Um, and so we measure the ratio of lead to uranium. And if it's 50-50, then we know that it's been 4.5 billion years since that uh, uranium sample was produced because half of it is now lead. Um, so that's an example of uh, radiocarbon dating. Uh, not carbon dating, but radio radiation data, radio radioactive dating. Um, Radiocarbon dating would be using carbon, but uh, anyway, so alpha decay. Um, so alpha beta particles, um, beta particles are just electrons. Alpha particles, um, an alpha particle is a helium-4 nucleus. So if we look at 4 helium, and we know that helium is 2, so that means uh, there are 2 neutrons and 2 protons in a helium nucleus, so that means... If something decays via alpha decay, that means the atom is going to emit two protons and two neutrons. Bloop, 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 bloop. And that collection of things are just going to shoot out of the atom. So if we're talking about uranium-234 decaying via alpha decay, it's going to become uranium, uh, sorry, thorium-234 because it's going to lose four nucleons. So we're going to take 238 minus 4. That gives us 234. It's going to become... Uh, thorium, because thorium is going to be two protons less than uh, uranium. So if we go to our, uh, there was a periodic table of the elements up here, I believe. Um, no, is that in the other uh, lecture? Shoot. Sorry. Okay, if, uh, let's go fly kite. Okay, let me pull this one up. We are in 31 let's go to here 
Now, wait a second. I was pretty sure I saw a periodic table. There we go. Okay, so um, uranium, 92. Thorium is 90. So when we decay via alpha, we give up two of our protons, and it becomes thorium-90 because we gave up two of the protons. Okay, um, so let's go back to 31. Okay, so uh, when we're talking about uh, alpha decay, and uh, this this should say thorium-90, that appears to be a typo. So we're going from 238 uranium, we're going to decay, we're going to turn into uh, thorium-234, I don't, I'm not sure what this is, what this notation is, 234 plus helium-4. Um, so we've decayed now to thorium by emitting a uh, helium-4 nucleus. Um, and yeah, yeah, so that's all that is. So here's your parent before, after, it's a little bit lighter, you emitted a uh, alpha particle, um, and, it's, and it's decaying. So a decay, a decay equation in general, um, you're going to lose a certain number of total nucleons A, some of them are going to be neutrons and some, sorry, protons, and some of them are going to be neutrons. So for alpha decay, it's very simple. You just take four off the top, four off your A, two off the neutrons, two off the protons. Sorry, I keep drawing that backwards. Two off the protons, two off the neutrons. And that's what um, your helium nucleus is taking away. So it's pretty simple. So um, uh, blah, 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 skip that. Um, yeah, so beta decay, beta decay, beta decay is interesting um, because, um, for example, cobalt can turn into nickel, and if I go back to uh, the previous lecture, uh, cobalt here um, is twenty seven, nickel is twenty eight. Uh, in order for cobalt to turn into nickel, what has to happen if we keep the same number of uh, nucleons, namely 60 or whatever was was in there. What we have to do is turn one of the neutrons into a proton so that we gain a proton in order to change our um, uh, our atom. So what happens in beta decay is we actually keep the same number of total nucleons, we just transform one of the neutrons into a proton. Uh, okay, and that's called uh, uh, beta decay. So beta decay is simply we're reducing the number of neutrons, turning it into a proton, um, and then so Z is going to become plus one and is going to be minus one, and then we end up uh, turning up uh, one of the things into uh, another thing. So in this, um, we've turned, if you go cross-eyed there and compare these two parent and daughter nuclei, you can see it turned one of the green things into a blue thing and then emitted a electron and an electron neutrino. So we took a neutron, we turned it into a proton, and we emitted an uh, electron and an electron neutrino. And this is um, the process that governs this. is called weak interaction. The weak nuclear force is responsible for something like beta decay. Um, so when I mentioned the, the strong force and the weak force and the whatever forces, um, this is what is governing uh, those things. Okay, um, so yes, uh, do we have to do this? No. Okay, so um, yeah, another beta, uh, another decay equation for beta particles. Um, same thing. Um, what we're doing is our parent nucleus is turning into a different nucleus uh, by either gaining an electron or a proton, not electron, a proton or a neutron, depending on whether it's a, a, a beta decay, B minus, beta minus or beta plus, a positron or an electron. Okay, um, gamma decay, so we got alpha, beta, gamma. Gamma decay um, is when the uh, nucleus just gets energized, and so it'll be written with this asterisk to say that it's excited. Um, and then when it decays, it doesn't actually change into anything. It just will emit some high-energy um, uh, particles. So it could be um, a very hot source, so s still nickel, but calming down to less excited nickel um, and emitting some uh, radiation in the process. Um, okay, so half-life and activity. So half-life is the time it takes for a sample to reduce to half of its uh, value. Um, so the first half-life, you're starting at 1,000, the time it takes 
for you to go from 1,000 to 500 is the half-life. How long does that take? And then the time it takes to go from 500 to 250 is your second half-life. The time it takes to go from 250 to 125 is your third half-life. And those time intervals are all the same. Um, and that's uh, what uh, the half-life is. And it's a very nice exponentially decaying curve here. Um, it's the opposite of what your bank account should look like. The equation describing that, whenever you see an exponential like that, you can think of e to the minus x. Um, and so in this case, the number at any given time along this curve, this red line, this line of best fit there, is um, anchored by these constants. Um, n would be your y value. n0 is what you start uh, when uh, you know x is, or in this case, t is 0, because e to the 0 is 1. Um, so when e when uh, t is zero, uh, n is your initial starting value, and then the sharpness or steepness of this curve depends on this value lambda, and that's your decay constant. And it tells you how quickly something decays or doesn't decay, um, and so the time it takes to get to a, a half of that would just be n divided by n zero equals a half, and then you can solve for t um, when that's when you get. A half there and remember to undo an e to the minus x you take the natural log of that and if you take the natural log of that you'll get minus x and then you can solve for uh, x that way so radioactive dating or radiocarbon dating is uh, by measuring the ratios of the decay products to the parent products you can measure the ratio of them and estimate how long it's been since a sample was created um, the Shroud of Turin was one of the famous things that was like, well, not maybe as old as it uh, is claims to be. Okay, so um, uh, so there's this. Yeah, it's only about 690 years based on measuring the uh, uh, carbon there. So let's go through this example just because it's a good one. Um, so the uh, there was a sample that was cut out of this thing, and it found that there was 92% um, uh, of the uh, carbon-14 was uh, remaining. So if 92% is there, that means n over n0 is 92, or 0.92. So 92% of the stuff is still there. So then we can use this equation, um, and we know the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, which means if we started with a, cap, uh, a pile of carbon-14 uh, in 5,730 years, we would actually have half of that um, amount. Uh, so it is known, uh, so once gamma t is known, we can use that equation to uh, find uh, the half-life. Um, or, so, yeah, find the, the time elapsed since that uh, time. Okay, so if we're at 0 0.92, we've, we just take our equation, n over n0 is 0 0.92, that equals e to the minus lambda t, and uh, you take the natural log to undo the exponential, and then uh, you put in for lambda what... Uh, lambda is, um, uh, and lambda is that, 0.693 divided by our half-life of 5,730 years. Um, oftentimes, you can look up what lambda is, it'll tell you anyway. Um, but you put that back in, boom, and you get 690 years uh, for the time to, it takes to decay to that uh, level. Um, Blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Da, da, da. Yeah, so the activity of a um, source is how many decays it has per second. Um, so the rate of decay is just number of decays per time. That's it. The Baccarel um, is the uh, SI unit, and it's just one decay per second. So if you have 10 Baccarels, that's 10 decays per second. Um, the other way you can measure it is with the Curie, and the Curie is uh, 3.7 times 10 to the 10 Baccarel, um, and it's defined as the activity of one gram of radium. Um, and so that's named after Marie Curie, who is a very famous uh, uh, nuclear physicist in the early 1900s. Um, she would have to teach her courses uh, under the name of a man 
so people wouldn't know a woman, a woman was teaching them outside of the college. Nobody cared at the college, but... Okay, um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. So, yeah, your rate of decay is related to the half-life by this uh, equation. And so you can uh, use that to figure out the activity of something based on its amount and half-life. Um, so you need to know how much stuff you're starting with and what is the half-life of the uh, of material that you're looking at. So if we're looking at carbon-14, we know that's half-life 5,730. To find N, we have to do some Avogadro stuff. Um, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, we multiply this 1.3 times 10 to the minus 12, uh, which is, yeah, the abundant of carbon-12 in a carbon sample of a living organism to get the number of carbon-14 nuclei in it. So one mole of carbon has an atomic, well, it has a mass of 12 grams, um, and we're saying it's pure carbon here. Uh, and then you can convert that to kilograms uh, or grams this way. And so the number of carbon-14 uh, nuclei in one kilogram of carbon is that, um, just unit conversion here. So then the activity is going to be plugging all these things in, and it's going to be 7 billion uh, activities per year, uh, or 7 billion decays per year. To go to Baccarel's, we got to put it into seconds, so that's 250 decays per second. Put it in terms of curies, it's 6.76 nanocuries. Um, for uh, comparison, the um, uh, Radioactive source at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics used for radiating uh, small animals to study cancer um, is six curies uh, of radiation. One minute of exposure to that would uh, give you radiation sickness, um, so it's very dangerous. Don't go there. It's locked in the basement. I go there all the time. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, the Chernobyl disaster. This is good. Um, there's a great thing, great video about radioactivity, and Chernobyl was one of the famous nuclear accidents um, in Ukraine, and uh, then Three Mile Island was a meltdown, and then there's the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown after the tsunami, and so on and so on, and the amount of radiation is this and that and this, but the amount of radiation that a smoker is exposed to, because... Um, Tobacco actually absorbs polonium, which is highly radioactive and very toxic to humans. Um, if I drew the same amount of radiation exposed to a smoker over a year compared to someone that was at Chernobyl or Fukushima or Three Mile Island, um, this is the amount of radiation a typical smoker is exposed to in a given year uh, because they're just constantly sucking in uh, radiation. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's something that I found interesting when I first learned it. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, binding energy. The, so the binding energy, you have your E equals MC squared. Um, so in the sun, the thing that powers the sun is that when you fuse two hydrogen atoms together and produce helium, the single helium atom is less than the individual hydrogen atoms that went into created. So the leftover energy... Um, equals mc squared, and that's the binding energy of your uh, nucleus that's holding everything together. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm just going to continue here. So this is your binding energy per nucleon. So this is why stars go supernova, by the way. You can see when you fuse things from hydrogen into helium, into lithium, into oxygen, into, uh, well, I don't see silicon on here, all the way up to iron... Once you get to iron, if you're at the core of the sun and you go to fuse iron together, you actually start going back down um, the slope. So you start requiring energy for fusion. So when, a, when the sun is providing energy to Earth, what it's doing is it's converting hydrogen to helium and the leftover mass, uh, the leftover binding energy is being released in the form of heat and that's what feeds us. Um, but once it gets to iron, which our sun will not, it will just whimper out and burn out soon. Yeah, in like 5 billion years. But a high-mass star um, will get all the way to iron, and once it gets to iron, boom, it collapses. There's no more fusion because it takes energy to continue the fusion rather than releasing energy, and the star collapses, either into a uh, neutron star or a black hole. Um, and in both cases, it, it explodes before it does that. 
in a very violent uh, thing. Okay, so um, yeah, you've got your equation here. It looks complicated. It's not just plug in your values uh, to find your binding energy per nucleon. Um, and so, for example, uh, for calculate the binding energy per nucleon for an alpha particle, just plug it in here. Um, eight is four, and you get 7.07 .07 MeV per nucleon um, by plugging all these values in. Okay, uh, there's an interesting thing uh, called tunneling, and I'm not quite sure it's in here, but tunneling is the ability of a proton or a neutron um, to get out of an atom, and uh, it's something that happens in quantum mechanics only, and it's because of the solutions to the wave equations that um, you can have a wave function, which means there's a non-zero probability to find an electron on the other side of a barrier, which may or may not be uh, large enough to, well, w could be large enough to keep the particle um, from jumping over to the other side. So there's a non-zero probability that the uh, um, uh, particle could jump over a quantum barrier. Um, and uh, it's a little bit exaggerated here in the way we talk about it. It's not as um, crazy as it sounds. Uh, but anyway, this is called quantum tunneling, and it's how all transistors work. It's how all modern electronics work. And the idea is that this, um, you know, you've got a barrier, a potential barrier. Unless this little green ball has enough energy to overcome this potential energy, it will never come over the edge of that uh, wall. But... Um, the uh, uh, occasionally, according to quantum mechanics, there's a non-zero probability that your electron um, could whoop, get enough energy to pop over on the other side of that thing. So we call that quantum tunneling. Um, so anyway, that's what that is. All right, that's that chapter. Talk to you guys later. Bye.